Um, excellent. Just to let everyone know, the seminar will be recorded for YouTube later on. Um, we, if, if anyone doesn't want to be recorded, please let us know um, in the later sections during the discussion, but it'll just be popping up with your chat. So it's, it's not really something to be too concerned about for privacy. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is do a welcome to country. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, uh, acknowledge that the lands and waterways of the Yarra catchment and beyond are the unceded territories of the Wurundjeri, Woi Wurrung people. We pay our respects to their ancestors who cared for the country since time began and to all Wurundjeri, Woi Wurrung community, to all Kulin nations and to all traditional owners who continue to speak and care for their country. We acknowledge the river now called the Yarra has always been known as the Birrung by its custodians. I, uh, oh, fantastic. We've got Clive back in. Uh, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Uh, we have two representatives from Acacia uh, who are both spending their entire careers working passionately along stretches of the, the Yarra. We've got Cameron Hall and Paul Murphy. Cam's background is primarily in the middle, middle Yarra reaches, uh, which he will talk to you in depth about today. Uh, and Paul has been focused mainly in the, uh, the lower Yarra area of uh, around Q and, and Baldwin. Uh, we also have Clive representing the Friends of Yarra Valley Parklands. Uh, he's been working with them for the last 30 years, true uh, exemplary conservationist, someone who's dedicated countless weekends uh, planting trees. And so we've got, uh, Clive will be able to talk us a little bit about some of the projects that they've been undertaking in the last, yeah, 30 years. So uh, we hope that today is a, a really fine opportunity for everyone to learn a little bit more about conservation uh, and potentially for ways that people can get involved. Moving forward, we really wanna try and uh, support all of the friends groups uh, who, more than anything, need need more engagement with um, with bigger audiences because it's uh, it's a difficult thing to to get in touch. So, if you have any interest, please at the end of uh, at the end of today, reach out to us, and we're happy to connect you with some of our projects or some of the friends groups that we work with uh, for their projects. It doesn't have to be a big commitment. It can be a singular weekend. It can be a day. It can be an afternoon. It can be a chat. Uh, but all of the efforts are worthwhile and, and really well received. So it'd be great. I would uh, like to just give a little bit of background for a few minutes about some of the projects that we have been uh, undertaking in the last 18 months. Let me just see if I can start uh, sharing my screen. All right, excellent. It's more of a success than last time. Uh, here we have our beautiful Yarra. I have made a little outline map just so that people can get a brief understanding of where some of the sites that the Yarra River Keepers have been working on in the last 18 months and will be working on moving forward are. It's uh, nice to know how close they are to your house. So you can gauge, uh, again, like time commitment and whether you could become a bit more of a permanent fixture in terms of maintenance and uh, being involved. In the lower Yarra reaches, we've got two sites in uh, close, close to the city. We've got uh, Burnley Harbour, which is just next to uh, Herring Island and Lloyd's Paddock, which is the next bend of the Yarra. Uh, next up, we've got Q Billabong, which Paul has got a lot of experience dealing with. He's been working with the Burundara Council for the last uh, several years, uh, redeveloping that area, revegetating. Re Further along, we've got uh, Q Bill, oh, sorry, that is Q Bill Long, uh, Andrew's Reserve, which uh, will be taking place in the next 12 months. Uh, lots of opportunity for community plantings, and it's really close to the city. So 
Uh, that's a, a key one that people would probably be interested in. Uh, as of next year, we'll be starting work on Murundaka, which I'm particularly excited about because of its indigenous uh, histories and significance. It's a much more intact system than the other sites I've been working on in the Lower Yarra. Uh, and again, lots of opportunity for community plantings. And finally, today's focus a little bit um, for the friends group at the, at the very least is the Westfold site that we have been developing and, and they've been working on for more than 30 years in terms of grassland projects and many other uh, reveg, reveg projects. Uh, this is a little bit of a close up of uh, the Burnley event that we held about a month ago. Uh, we had about 60 volunteers down. Uh, I'd love to say this is a prime example of how the weather is on all of our community plantings, but uh, that's that could have just been luck. Not sure, but it was a fantastic day. Uh, really great to see everyone get down. We had a, a really diverse crowd and lots of families. And we were also really impressed with the quality of the plantings because that, uh, yeah, it's a big reflection of uh, of community plantings. We, it, one of the biggest challenges is just making them consistent. And we were incredibly impressed with uh, the quality of the plantings and yet to see any, any of the plants uh, die, which is great news. Uh, this is a, a small little snap, snapshot of what the section of the Burnley Harbour looked like beforehand uh, and after the planting. Uh, it's a high exposure sites right next to a bouldering wall. And we're really uh, hoping that we can have further reveg work moving forward in that area uh, and more closely work with uh, the climbing community. A project that we were meant to be uh, showing today in, in person, but unfortunately because of COVID we've had to shift to a online medium is the Westerfolds uh, Park. Uh, the sections that we personally are working on at the moment are is just near the canoeing club and it's an uh, area of previous free veg work uh, unfortunately because of the amount of rabbits and uh, weed presence there's there's very little uh, ground cover shrubs and understory so we're hoping to install uh, yeah 250 native shrubs and ground covers to try and uh, increase the uh, biodiversity of that section uh, finally, Andrew's Reserve, uh, another one we've worked on in the last month or so. Uh, it's a very large site. We've currently sprayed about 5,000 square metres of kaikuyu grass, which we're going to be converting to native, uh, native species. We've discovered some really strong patches of microlina, native grass, that we're going to be fostering and uh, hand weeding tirelessly. I'm, I'm pretty sure that the friends group are going to be helping out with that a lot. So. Um, very fortunate to have them on board with us. Uh, and yeah, in the next 12 months, we'll have lots of opportunities for planting days uh, within a ride to, to close reaches of the city. I think it's about 5Ks from the CBD. Uh, this is a bit of a rough timeline and some rough planting numbers to give you a, a bit of scope. We've really ramped up our plantings. Um, and hoping that we can continue to do so over the coming years. Um, but that is actually largely dependent on the amount of involvement that we have from community. Uh, if we have people that we can, can assist with the planting side of things, we can really stretch our conservation funding and, uh, and make a much greater impact. So the, the last time I'll, I'll ask today, but if, if you wanted to get involved, you're, um, you're more than welcome. Um, that's probably it for me for the moment. Uh, I'll hand over to Clive, who's managed to join us again, which is great. And he can uh, tell you a little bit about the Friends Group. Yes, hello, everybody. Um, I'll just uh, start with a little bit of a history of the Westerfolds area first, actually. Um, up until the 1970s, it was basically farmland and it had cleared trees, it had cleared areas and not many trees. Um, the land was threatened by various proposals to turn it into a golf club or a shopping centre or a housing development. Uh, luckily, some friends groups in the 70s started fighting to save the land for a public park. Uh, the groups lobbied, were very active and lobbied very hard. And eventually in 1977, 
Dickhamer, uh, Premier Dickhamer saved the area and it became Westerfolds Park and added to the Yarra Valley Parklands. Since then, as you can see, the park rangers and friends groups have been revegetating the whole area. Uh, the rangers also encouraged and developed several wetlands which support native flora and fauna. The rangers also experimented with direct seeding in some large bare areas. I remember in one park that it took nearly two years waiting for the right conditions and then only two days for the tractor to seed all the chosen areas. As well as Westerfolds, um, the regeneration has also been happening in other parks uh, along the Yarra nearby. A good example is Candlebark Park, just across the road from Westerfolds. Uh, um, here, the original open cow paddocks have been replanted, joined up with native vegetation, and they give a large bushy area that you see now. Because Candlebark was a large area, we learnt about the technique of the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, first, the area is surveyed and mapped to show the native vegetation in patches of good, bad and ugly. Um, for the good patches, we concentrated on them first, preserving them, enhancing them, extending them. Um, for the bad areas, we slowly worked on improving them uh, and extending them and where possible joining them up into larger areas of better vegetation. And for the ugly areas, our aim was to just control them and to prevent them expanding until we could get back to them in the future. The scheme is probably better expressed in the Yarra, Keeper, Yarra River Keepers new Yarra Regeneration Guide, which describes how you can work on areas one step at a time. Um, now I'll say a little bit about our group, the Friends of Yarra Valley Parks. Um, we started in 1991, 30 years ago. We're actually based at Westerfolds and we have the support of Westerfolds Park Rangers and we work mainly on Parks Victoria land. Um, as well as planting in Westerfolds, we planted various other sites um, along the Yarra from Bulleen up to Warrandyte. We're often pleasantly surprised when we visit areas that were bare 20, 30 years ago. We see how our small tube stock has grown into thick native bush. And we also see how our follow-up plantings have added to the understory. Even though it seems we only put in a small number of plants each session, it's inspiring to see that the cumulative effect over the years builds into major improvements. Um, on the practical side of things, our friends group have plantings once a month on Sunday mornings. We normally plant only during the wetter six months of the year. And in the drier months, we return to old plantings and do weeding and maintenance. We've mainly planted tube stock individually and uh, used guards and stakes to protect the plants from rabbits and kangaroos. Recently, we've had to go to double height guards to overcome browsing by kangaroos and deer who've come in lately. Um, aside from Westerfolds, um, over the last 10 years, our group has led a large project to re-establish an old wetland further down the Yarra. It involved lots of initial earth moving and then extensive planting. Uh, the wetland also has many small pools to filter the water and to improve its quality before it flows into the Yarra. The pools also support local fauna and birds over the dry summers. We thank Mill Mortar for the funds for most of this work. You can see the tractors at work on the screen now. Um, and now that the wetland is fully established, um, we've organised to add native fish too. Um, separately, we do bird surveys and uh, I have identified some rare birds attracted to this wetland. Um, separate from the planting, um, we've done some work on the strategic side of things. We have contributed to the Yarra strategic plan at a planning panel last year. And our major success was the panel giving the friends groups uh, much larger representation in future Yarra projects. Um, we also belong to the Victorian Environmental Friends Network, VEFN, which is an umbrella group for friends groups. 
it, resent, it represents and supports us when we're talking to large agencies like Parks Victoria and Northern Water. We're now also pleased to start working with the Yarra River Keepers on future Yarra projects. As you can see, the Friends groups do many other things besides planting. So I hope this gives you an insight into the grassroots of small volunteer groups. It also shows that with a bit of planning and support from land agencies, volunteers and volunteer groups can achieve long-term sustained outcomes. There are quite a few different friends groups up and down the era, so you can pick the ones that best suit your timetable and best suit the sort of works you like to do. In summary, you can see that the level and range of native vegetation that we enjoy today is a result of numerous small scale projects that all contributed not only to Westerfolds, but to other parks along the Yarra. And I'll finish there. Thanks. Thanks, Bo. It was, uh, it was great. Really uh, interesting photo library that you have forwarded through. Uh, I was particularly fascinated by the historical photos of Westerfolds to see how much the vegetation has changed in the last 70 years. Very significant. Uh, now, Kev or, or Paul, would you like to jump in? Yeah, I'll jump in. Yeah. And I'll just pin this up here. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Perfect. Um, yep. So my name's Cameron and I'm a project manager at Acacia. So I've been working in and around the middle Yarra for about seven years or so, um, working on, with Parks Victoria and Melbourne Water. And I was also fortunate enough to grow up in the area that I'm going to talk to you about today. So for those of you who don't know the area, this is um, Morrison's Reserve here. So basically we have Warren Dyke to your north and you've got your Westerfolds Park here to your south. And this is uh, Westerfolds, if you can see my mouse, that comes in and around here. So this is an important reserve because it's fascinating for a variety of reasons. It's got a lot of cultural and a lot of flora and fauna values that aren't found anywhere else in Melbourne. And for those of you who are a little bit more interested, it's also home to the recent, more recent, I would say about like 60s and 70s, your mud brick house movement that actually occurred along um, your Laughing Waters Road here. So if anybody's like your Gordon Fords or your Alistair Knox fans, this is the spot for you. So why is this area so important? Why is it so intact today? And I guess you can see a lot of that just by this photo and seeing the different land use and the different land values um, around it really. So this block was owned by the Morrison family for about a century. And you can, this is their old house block here. And you can just see the way that to the north of the river and the south of the river, just how differently they've been managed. So the Morrison family didn't stop the land that heavily. They didn't clear a lot of land. So we had a lot of those values kind of kept intact within this corridor of the river, um, including down to the, to the river itself. And to the south, you can see here, very different land use in which we've got a lot more clearing, a lot more of your scattered trees, your more agricultural settings. And it's because of this that we actually have some great values that are within, as I said, within Morrison's and extend down to the river, such as this guy here. So this is a significant EBC because it's your Valley Grassy Forest EBC. So it was cleared a lot back in the day or grazed a lot um, just because it's a nice open land, a lot of grass, a lot of fodder, I guess you could say. And Morrison's actually has one of the best intact valley grassy forests, with, if not the best within your greater Melbourne region. And it's actually home to the Clover, uh, the Clover Glycine, so Glycine latrobiana, which was actually thought to be extinct until the 70s, until Cam Beardsall rediscovered it. And that actually went on to have a big impact in, um, in some um, soybean genetics and within that scientific community. I won't go into that today. And then we also have another threatened EVC within this region, which is your Herbridge Foothill Forest. Um, I believe this is a critically endangered EVC and it just connects to your Valley Grassy Forest. Um, so this is the headwaters of the Laughing Waters Creek that flows into the Yarra River. And once again, these little communities um, were often cleared or grazed just because um, 
of the kind of feed and the kind of areas they were in. And the home to little guys like this guy, which I found the other day whilst I'm walking through. So this is your um, Signagaton striata. So here's a little more aquatic, more riparian herb found along creek lines or in really damp spots. And you can see here just within your little um, junkus, you can see all his seed pods coming up through here. Only gets to about, oh, maybe 15 centimetres high and has really small little ribbons on its leaves. Um, apart from this guy that we have, we also have a variety of other species within the park on the river um, that both have their cultural significance and their environmental significance too. So we've got things like your mat rush, which, um, which would have been used traditionally for your basket weaving, as well as um, your seed pods we use to make a, make a flower. And also you can even reach down to the base, um, rip a stem out, you're actually chew on the base and it's quite sweet and sugary. You've also got your Pymelia axiflora, which is your bootlace bush. And that was used a lot for um, making ropes, basket weaving, all that kind of thing. Uh, your Goodyear ovata, which is your hop gardenia. This is more just a rarer species that we actually reintroduced back into the park in this region that had been lost due to grazing change fire regimes. And this is one that probably a lot more people are familiar with, is, which is your Prostanthera. Um, Lacianthos so or your Victorian Christmas bush and this would have been used to um, flavour foods because it's just got a little bit of a minty kind of like a minty tone to it. On the river itself um, they're very different complexes and as soon as you step into the river environment it's a different ball game so we have a whole different suite of species which makes this middle part of the area quite significant particularly on these um, these rapid complexes they're very niche and very selective. So we've got your species like Lobelia, Pedunculata, your Matted Pradia. Here's just a little nice little ground cover herb. Your blue star shaped flowers, um, which comes up on your mud flats really specifically during summer. And one of my favorites is your Carex as well, Polyantha, which is your river sedge. This is an interesting species because it will only grow in situ in the river on your rocks and on your rapids as well. You won't find it up on a bank. You'll rarely find it along your creek edge. It really likes those kind of like gnarly conditions. And tucked in amongst here too, I know it's hard to see, but we've got a little beauty called Isacne globosa, which is fun to say, called your swamp millet. Um, and so here's a, a little native grass that grows in some really wet spots. It has a beautiful purple flower on it. And unfortunately I don't have a photo here today, but this little patch here was only found on one rapid complex within the middle Yarra. Remember from that basically west of Olds all the way up to Warrandyte. So we've actually done some work in the past, particularly working with parks in Melbourne Water to actually propagate this and um, place it on different rapid complexes within the Yarra. And this is a stand of mutton woods as well, which I'm sure some other people would be aware of. Um, a significant species in terms of it's actually a remnant rainforest species. So it occurs more up and down the east coast of Australia. Um, and it kind of stands out in the Yarra because it's not your typical dry species that we're kind of all used to, particularly up in the middle Yarra. Um, and the Yarra River itself is actually its most southern range as well. So from this point, it doesn't occur anywhere west, kind of drops out of the system. So it's kind of a good indicator species. So, with all the significant species I've just talked about, I thought it's time to touch on the eel trap project and Grumby Barn. So, the reason behind this project was, with all the values I highlighted, it was indicated that the site needed a little extra attention. So, Acacia and the Narrow team geared up together with the help of all the stakeholders to enhance and preserve the existing natural and cultural values within the area. So this involved the Nevins, the Wandons and the Terex of the family. And basically we were just trying to get their connection to country a little bit more. And we learned from them as well within the landscape. Whoops, sorry, a little bit far ahead. So some of the things that we did, we established a ceremony circle and a meeting place along the Morrison homestead and also planted some fences. Excuse me, some of the existing areas on the site, we've got your silkcrete and this was actually traded across the Plenty River. And as you can see here, 
it is not a natural material from this area and it would have been traded for things like your food and your other resources but we've also got um, a tow, tow hole tree on site and also your eel trap too so this is the ceremony circle that we actually put together with the help of the NARAP team to add those additional cultural values to. So this is the ceremony circle that actually sits along the old Morrison's block. And you can see the old European kind of history in your trees in the background here too. And these are the scar trees that we put in with, um, with the help of the NARAP team. So each tree represents your, your Wandan, your Nevins and your Terex. Forgive me, I can't remember exactly what tree is what. I think the eel is your Wandans. So some interesting things. And I kind of just like this photo here as well because it kind of shows a juxtaposition between the two worlds and the two cultures in which we've got your cultural on your left and we've got your old Morrison property and kind of that European lineage, lineage on the right kind of working together a little bit, which was part of this project. And I just really like this photo one, but this is also goes to show the species I mentioned about your Isacne globosa. This is one of those important river complexes I was talking about. And you can actually see, I know it's very hard to tell and that everything looks like grass, but these are your patches of your Isacne globosa, which was actually part of a reintroduction program. And as you can see, it's going along very well. And this leads me to the eel trap a little bit more. So this is us working with the Narrow team back in 2019, when we we're just doing some rock works along them, along the Yarra here. And a little bit of background as well. So Basically, how the eel trap came about and how it was discovered to be an eel trap was through none other than Cam Beardsall. So it basically followed on from two events, which was the Willow Removal Program that parks, sorry, that Melbourne Water ran back in the 90s and also breaking of the millennium drought in the 2000s. So basically Melbourne Water came through and removed all the willows, which actually ran kind of from your bank here all up and along across the eel trap at the time almost to the other side of the river. So once Melbourne Water removed these willows, we still had very below average rainfall and the river kind of stayed the same, basically until the drought broke. So once the drought broke, it picked up all this mud and all this sediment and kind of fl really flushed the entire river system in which Cam came down and kind of saw this structure in, in the middle of the river and kind of started to question with the old property owners, the Morrisons, to see if they knew anything about it, if there'd been any history there in which they hadn't. And that kind of reinforced for him that this was something significant and was in fact an eel trap as his suspicions. But it wasn't until 2008 that it actually got verified that it was in fact an eel trap. And the willows had actually preserved it under the mud for probably about a century. So this is the eel trap mall today. And I know obviously this system would have been used for eels, but more specifically your short finned eels. And this trap in this section of the Yarra is actually important because up above here is only one of two spots along this, along the Yarra where the eels congregate. And um, your local Wurundjeri people knew about that at the time. So fitting into all this is kind of that life cycle of the eel. So the eel would migrate from the freshwater to the sea um, when they're adults, basically to breed and spawn, in which they'd travel all the way up the coast to the Coral Sea off Queensland, very far. And Basically, from there, they'll, um, their young would be would be born, and they'll kind of get strong enough to come back into these river systems about one to three years of age, and they'd start their way back upstream to migrate, in which they then mature in the rivers. So the Wurundjeri knew this, and they often held an eel festival every autumn and summer once these eels were kind of making their migration, and it was the women's job to maintain this rock wall, which you can see here, to about three to four feet high, sometimes a little bit higher annually or as needed. And they'll then get into this billabong at the back, which um, it's probably about ranges from about knee high to about waist high. And between the women and the children that actually herd the eels down to points like this. So using those instruments and materials I was talking about before, like your lamandra longifolia and using like your your bootlace pushed a tie it all together. They would install eel traps, not just at one point, but at multiple points down a little rock shoot in which they'd try to make the most out of, kind of out of the bounty for the season. An interesting thing as well too was they were actually wise in the fact that they didn't harvest 
um, the female eels either. So your female eels often have a little bit of a more silvery sheen and that actually put them back to keep with the breeding cycle. So this is just the eel trap today, a little bit more. And as you can see, these are the, the Carex polyanthers that I was talking about before, just growing right in the middle of the river. And this is a little butte and a very important and key species and indicator of health within the river. And that's your eel grass. So it's key to your short finned eel populations as they feed off it, seek shelter in it. And, but it's also really important for your native fish stocks too. So, which they do the same, they even breed in there as well. Um, they oxygenate the water and they just form large mats along the river. And these populations were hit of eelgrass really hard when the river was choked up by fire willows. Um, so once they were removed, the willows went and often your carp populations dropped down too. So this is making a great recovery. And a lot of people don't realize or it's not widely known that the Yarra River is actually, has the highest fish diversity in the state around Victoria. So both through introduced species and native species, but it's an important river system because of that. And what else? And basically now that I've kind of talked about the values as well, it's, I think it's important to recognize some of the, some of the threats and impacts and even following on from what Clive has said of what's, what we work with within the Yarra Corridor here. So on top of our introduced uh, feral animals, we've also, and your weed species, we've also got a lot of this grazing going on as well. So basically you know, up in this corner, that, um, that rare, that single species I was talking to you about before, your Isacne globosa. So this is a protected patch in that carex that you might be able to see. And you can see here just adjacent to it, it's been a little munched. Um, your rainforest muttonwood species. Um, this is a little guy here who won't get really much above knee high due to grazing by deer, rabbits kangaroos, oh, the whole myriad. And this poor um, Callistum seabury eye too, which won't really get above knee height unless he's a little bit more protected. So how we dealt with that and following on a little bit more from with the eel trap too, was some of our techniques that we used to help manage the lands with this, with this problem, with this issue. And as you can see here on the left is one of our reveg plots that we did with the Narrat team, which contains both foot bush fruits and um, just locally threatened and just even um, species that are meant to be here on the left. It's about four to five years old. And then on the right, you can see here, this is a lot more open and looks very different, even with the plant guards that are still there. And on the other side, just down here, we have another similar fence, which is doing the same thing, but protecting a remnant area. That's already, that's already in the park. And this is that clover glycine plot I touched on before in that rare um, and vulnerable EBC. So on the left is basically where your clover glycine, glycine latrobiana plot is here. And on the right is the same EBC, but just looking very different, different. So we've applied these two techniques to kind of like the new and the past to kind of get some really outstanding results. And basically this is us hand weeding on the rapid complex below the eel trap. And I just thought it was a nice photo to kind of include. This is at its peak in summer where it's looking nice and lush. And yeah, that's all from me at this stage. Fascinating. Thank you so much, Cameron. That was incredible. I, uh, I think I've got a new favorite animal, eels. Uh, we've got you on mute, asked to unmute. Sorry, that was me. That's uh, okay. No worries. <laughs> That's it. Um, yeah, fantastic. I'll, I'm looking forward to asking a few questions later, but I'll um, just hand over to Paul. Definitely. Uh, for the next one. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Paul. I'm also from Acacia Environmental. I'm a project manager. I've been working with Acacia for three years now uh, in NRM for 15 years. So just going to do just a quick presentation on what it is I do with the Burundara City Council um, uh, with our reveg projects. So I'll just start sharing the screen. All right, so talking basically about the Yarra River Corridor that's between Kew and Baldwin is where we do the majority of our planting. 
Uh, for example, this year we're going to be putting in about 18 to 20,000 plants in this particular area across four, four or five different sites. Um, we've already done an acknowledgement of country. We're all aware that uh, it's uh, not, not our land, but we're taking care of it as best we can. So here's some pretty pictures of the, you know, what, 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 what we're used to seeing, beautiful big river red gums, somewhat of a, a mid-story in this flooded riparian woodland. Our main four sites are Willsmere Billabong, Chandler Park, Freeway Golf and Yarra Flats. They're all such beautiful areas. If you ever get a chance, head on down there and have a look. Uh, Willsmere Billabong has some amazing remnant um, uh, river red gums. Chandler Park has a uh, Wurundjeri Trail that looks at cultural heritage. Uh, Freeway Golf is a little bit inaccessible and Yarra Flats is accessible um, by some bike trails. So who are our funding and partners? We work with the city of Burundara, who have been doing 10 plus years um, revegetating the Yarra Corridor. Uh, they have a really good commitment to revegetate one hectare, which doesn't sound like much, but when you put it in, in action, it's you know those 20,000 plants per year. And then on top of that, each year they go back and they'll add more um, to the existing reveg just to ensure that that diversity is increased year to year. Yarra Riverkeeper, obviously we've just started working with recently. We're currently working on a number of different sites with them, monitoring and planting. And I'll be doing the, um, the Q or Willsmere Billabong that Lockie was talking about before, which is an additional 5,000 plants around, um, around Willsmere Park, which will just look amazing in a few years. Uh, and finally, Melbourne Water, the Corridors of Green Grant, which I don't know if you're aware of, Melbourne Water do you know, amazing work across the board, but one of the things that, that uh, I guess some community and local government groups can access is the Corridors of Green, and they'll provide a grant to do revegetation works um, in just in different areas. I'll put a link to that at the end. So of course, this is pretty obvious to most people, but just in case you didn't know, why revegetate? Biodiversity, fragmented habitats, is especially prevalent in places like Burundara in the urban areas. So we've lost a lot of the mid-story and the ground story due to you know, clearing, development, um, uh, farming. So what we try and do is join up that riparian corridor so that over time, we'll see it all become you know, one big fluid uh, revegetation patch. Habitat loss in urban areas is pretty prevalent too. And of course, we revegetate because green space is necessary for all of us. Like we all feel better when we go for a, for a walk in the bush. Um, important for mental health and physical health. And of course, climate change, very simple equation, more plants, less carbon. So where do we start when we do our revegetation? I think Clive touched on this. Obviously we do mapping. We look at current and, current and future use revegetation zones. So we can look at maintenance in the future and work out how much we're going to be revegetating. And therefore we can look at our plant density. You know, generally speaking, we do six per square meter um, with grasses, sometimes more, um, and depending on the, on the mid story. So yeah, we, once we know the area, we can establish how many plants we might use and of which species. Preparation to Burundara is substantial. We do two years using a combination of slashing, raking, um, some herbicide application. We also use a new technology of hot water application, which has no herbicide use. Uh, we target weeds at the appropriate time so that they we get a better you know a better result over time. And of course, mulching to suppress weed growth so that in that two year space we have you know a pretty much a blank canvas where we know we're going to have great success. Uh, here's an example of Chandler Park conservation area. You know, the blue zones are what we've done in the past. Red zones are what we're doing currently. And then the purple is future use. Uh, the green is, is what is currently revegetated re and is already a conservation zone. So you can see there that we've got, you know, a, a mix of uses and what we're going to be looking at in the future as we work our way down the Yarra Corridor. So, you know, pretty much a lot of it, especially at Chandler Park and Willsmere Billabong, will be done in the next few years, which is amazing. 
uh, revegetation action. There's some pretty pictures of uh, plants going in the ground. Uh, plant selection is based on flooded riparian woodland EVC. Um, obviously, probably you guys have all probably seen this. Uh, it's beautiful big river red gums. Um, our sites are constrained by factors such as limited space. Um, obviously, we only have that 30 metres from the river. The rest of it is green space that is re council requires to use for people to you know, have activities and that sort of stuff. So we have to be aware of what we plant and, and how much we plant in what space. Uh, we use local provenance to ensure that those plants have best survival. Species are clumped in, whoa, in groups to form natural islands, which is what would happen originally in nature. And we use habitat enhancements such as logs, leaf litter and rocks. And this is encouraging fauna into the area over time. A typical species list you can see there, um, the priority is mid-story and understory. So lots of lamandras and poas, uh, Danthonium, you know, I don't know if you guys are aware of, of, of all these ones here. I haven't put the common names in, but uh, you can get the slides later on and look them up. Lots of wildflowers, some lilies, uh, which is the, the geophytes, um, a bit of a, a colorful mid-story. So there's, you know, there's always lots of thought that goes into this and it's always part of that, that river red gum EV, EVC that we, that we try and aim for. So here's a few good shots of before and after, which is, you know, what it comes down to is like seeing your change and your work over time is so, it's, it's wonderful. So that's a 2016 planting just along the Yarra there. And we've got some recruitment of caches, all the lamandras are huge, the grasses have established and, and really suppresses the majority of the weeds in the area. Uh, this is Melbourne Water Corridors of Green grant from 2018. And this is the, the area that was prepped over the, those, that two year process. And then this is present where we've got established grasses, lots of chrysocephalum, you know, bands of lamandras down the bottom. So another, another good success story. Uh, and this is a more recent one. So Moosme Billabong, uh, where we've manually removed a lot of this, this biomass in the middle and we've mulched it, kept it uh, weed free. And then this is the recent planting where we put in, you know, I think uh, that was about 3,000 trees, plants, shrubs, and grasses. So the long-term goals are obviously to maintain the site, you know, for the years after to ensure successful reveg, as with the maintenance. And we do brush cutting, herbicide use, mulching, all the usual NRM tools to keep it, you know, in, in good condition. Over time, native vegetation will outcompete most of the weed species. So our, you know, our goal is to establish it. As with, uh, well, Clive and, and Cam both have herbivorous mammals on site. Burundara has nothing, no rabbits, no kangaroos, no wallabies. We have one resident wombat, which is, uh, doesn't eat very much. So it's really, but there's no, there's, no, there's no tree guards. It's just put the plants in the ground and we have a very, very high success rate. So it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's wonderful to see. Um, and obviously increasing biodiversity, as I said before, Burundara will go through and put in wildflowers and new species and, and you know, each year just top them up each, each revegetation area to improve the biodiversity. We also monitor for Yarra Riverkeeper at Wheelsmere Billabong. We'll look at some pretty standard things that we'll measure over time. Native flora and vegetation cover, significant weed species. We do a bird census before and after, and of course, photo points. And this will just give us an idea. And you know, if this monitoring is done over the course of five or 10 years, you really get to see a huge change over time. Uh, there is great floral communities in Burundara that we're working on. And with that, we will enhance the, the habitat for fauna. Um, as you can see there, put in parrots, cockatoos, wombats, snakes, frogs, gliders. So there's been nesting boxes put in at, uh, Burund by Burundara City Council at Willsby Billabong, Freeway Golf and Yarra Flats. Monitoring was conducted to establish the glider populations in the area to see how many were there were, and then nesting boxes were added to, um, to uh, enhance their habitat. And there are currently gliders in these boxes, which is great. So some links, if you wanna get the slides later on, Lockie can give them to you, Burundara, uh, the Woiwurrum Council, our website and Melbourne Water. Um, thanks to Peter Tucker, who gave me some photos and slides for this. 
and to the Yarra River Keeper guys for all their hard work. And like I said, there, when we're allowed to travel more than 10k from home, please come and visit these sites. They're just they're just a great place to just spend some time and, and look at all our handiwork. Uh, I hand it back to you, Lockie, for questions. Thank you very much, Paul. That was great. And uh, I can personally vouch that the uh, Willsmere Billabong is pretty stunning to go. I was uh, there a few weeks ago and saw a bunch of 20 frog mounts in the middle of the park, which was great to see. Um, nice to know that you've been releasing snakes as well. That's always reassuring, but it's a core part of the ecosystem. So that's good. <laughs> um, I would like to uh, run over a few of the questions that we've had during the presentations uh, so far, and then we'll just kind of open up, um, open up to the, to the floor if anyone else has any, any questions. Um, the first question that I've seen, uh, I think was, uh, for you, Clive, in relation to the revegetation handbook um, from Carolyn. Um, let's see if I can unmute everyone. Clive, can can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, what was the question? The uh, I uh, not sure whether that was uh, in relation to the Yarra River Keeper Regeneration Guide or, or a handbook in relation to your friends group. Uh, Caroline was wanting to use it for Scotchman's Hill and Morondite. Um, probably, yeah, best if you go to the Yarra River Keeper's website and you can download the PDF of the uh, Great. Yarra Regeneration Guide and that's got all the, all the good stuff in it. Excellent. So that was, was ours. Yeah, I can vouch that is on our, on our website. It's pretty easy to track down. Um, I'll provide a link uh, at the end of this as well. Um, Morrison's Reserve, Cam, is, is that one open to the public? Yeah, it certainly is. So um, there's a number of like vehicle and walking tracks that you can go around in there. It's a good day, actually. It's um, quite a large parking. You can often just, if you park at the corner of Yarrabray and Reynolds Road in Eltham, that'll lead you right to it. Yeah, great. I'm, uh... Looking forward to going out with uh, Cam, Cam Beardsall in the next couple of months, hopefully, and, and seeing this uh, eel trap firsthand. Beautiful. Yeah. And it's uh, worthwhile to visit the park during um, your spring and summer, because as I said, those fences and some of those floral communities, you actually, that's where you actually see Melbourne's remnant wildflowers kind of in action at a good year. And same with our native grasses. So it's quite spectacular. You get a good um, indication of kind of what once was. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I had a quick question. I, I think I ask this every time I speak to anyone who knows uh, anything about remnant bushland, but uh, have you seen any yam daisies around there? Still yet to track down the, the location in Victoria. Yes, yes, we, um, we do have yam daisies in there. So, and even some that we did plant back as part of the eel trap project, but there are some remnant ones kicking around in there too. Mm. All of the different yeah. fences. You can remember your hunt there, Lockie. Absolutely. I remember being told about that in uh, at university and uh, being astonished that it was, you know, a prolific food source for the local indigenous. And now it's, uh, you know, really difficult to track down uh, because they were too tasty for sheep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I probably open this to um, both, both Cam and Paul. Um, I'm not personally, I haven't asked with the um, nurseries ourselves, but the Northeast, North, East link uh, and whether that's going to be impacting plant supplies in the coming years? I wouldn't think so. There's a number of different, um, I guess, nurseries and plant supplies that we use. And as long as you, um, as long as you can't kind of get an order in early and kind of know what we're after, then they're normally quite open to keeping up the supply as well. So with some of the plant supply that we get from some of our nurseries in the hundreds of thousands sometimes <laughs> they can normally um they can normally keep up as long as you just allow kind of six to nine months about of growing time if you're after some certain specific individuals yep uh, good to good to hear um so i know there definitely was a bit of a shortage this season because of covid so uh a reasonable concern if northeast link are going to be buying as you say hundreds of thousands of plants but no, get in early and you'll be, you'll be okay, it looks like. Um, the next question from uh, Callum uh, was for Clive. 
Uh, he was asking, uh, how was the direct seeding project done in terms of seed collection, participating parties, and how is that applied to the land with a tractor? Uh, yes, it, um, they collected bucket loads of seed. For, I presume this is the Westerfolds ranges, um, heaps of wattle seed and gum seed and everything else. Uh, and then on the back of the tractor, there was a big, you know, I guess like a 44 gallon drum or something that dribbled the seed into a plow and the tractor just plowed various straight lines of trees. Um, we discovered later on that they put in way too much seed and the, and the gum trees were all growing, you know, only a hand span apart. And, uh, there's a lot of tree competition, but I guess it's sorting itself out now. Um, all this was done about 15 years ago, so I'm not sure whether there's new techniques and um, we've learned a lot from that uh, old experiment. Um, but at least now we've got quite large areas in Candlebark Park that are, are really just forests and that's great. Yeah, absolutely. Did um, Cam and Paul, did you have much experience with uh, wetlands uh, restoration or or kind of going from a greenfield green field site to the installation of a wetland? Yeah, um, yeah, we do a bit of that work actually. So a lot of our projects are multifaceted and a couple of the projects we've just finished recently, particularly one we planted, I think about, was about eight wetlands, which were basically from basically civil construction sites to fully functioning and biodiverse wetlands at this stage. So. We've um, taken that upon ourselves over the past probably maybe three, four years, and really building up steam in that area. They're fascinating environments, those wetlands. Yeah, they, they're so successful so quickly. It looks amazing. Yeah. Excellent. Do you, uh, in relation to the wetland with the direct seeding, um, which Clive was mentioning, do you think that thinning some of those stands is, would be worthwhile or just kind of letting them naturally uh naturally compete uh, just to clarify a bit the direct seeding was done on the sides of hills it wasn't done in relation to the um wetland, wetland or anything um, it was just the broad area like the old cow paddocks yeah right okay yeah i've done i've done ecological thing in the past for whittlesea city council in terms of uh, red gums and i don't i don't i don't see there's any any harm in it Yeah, well, depending on the species themselves, we might see um, coppicing or, or, or various regrowth methods, but could allow for a healthier upper upper canopy to be established, perhaps. Yep. Again, I'd revert, revert to the experts. It all depends, I guess, back at, at the end of the day, what values or what goal you're looking to achieve and kind of um, putting the plan in action from there. Yeah, uh, I think this is a question for um, for all, all of us. Uh, Gillian's just asked, have there been uh, any or many issues with soil contamination at the sites? Um, we've, we're, as far as the friends groups go, we've had um, we've been working on pretty much previous bushland, so we haven't had any contamination we can I can think of. Um, we've really had a bit of a head start because. Um, we just had to enhance the vegetation that was there. So that was good. And yeah. that's the same on my end too. No real issues with past or soil contamination. Yep. All, all we've had to compete with is uh, a bit of bit of uh, excess fill from the freeway being pushed onto our reveg sites. But um, uh, it's not, 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 nothing, not, nothing contaminated. Yeah. I guess that's also kind of part of the function of some of these um, newer wetlands, they can kind of act as biofiltration ponds in, in themselves and, you know, manage to deal with relatively contaminated areas. Uh, we're looking into uh, starting to get into soil analysis for some of our sites um, to try and have that as a, a factor that we can look at, um, which as a, a friend of mine is, is working on a thesis at the moment, uh, looking into why certain uh, natives aren't regenerating, like their seed banks just aren't naturally restoring themselves. Uh, and she's looking at it from the perspective of soil analysis. So 
looking forward to hearing what comes out of that because I think it's a question that a lot of people do ask uh, for previous re reveg sites as to why particularly the urbanized ones maybe aren't able to reseed naturally. Do you have any uh, any thoughts or input about that on your own sites? Yeah, I've seen on, on a lot of reveg sites that because it's either the soil is compressed or the soil horizon is completely gone, there's lack of that organic layer, um, even down to the fact that the, the microbiome in the soil is, is changed or been eradicated, that you won't get the same success as you would in, in you know, a very natural environment where you do have established colonies of, of, of fungi in the soil, you have the right soil profile and horizons, Therefore, plants will just, that's what they're used to growing in. So any modified landscape is going to pose its own suite of challenges for plants, you know. So, it, it, of course, it's site dependent, but, yeah, there's lots of factors in play in, in any environment that can change a plant's ability to adapt and succeed in that environment. So, yeah, I think soil testing is important, but look, you could also, I've seen, you can also get um, tablets that will replace the soil microbiome mm. And you can put there, but you put it available from shore grow. You can put it in the soil, and instead of nutrients, it's adding the right amount of microorganisms in the soil to assist the plant with growth. Because we all know now that's an essential part of of the soil and the surrounding interaction between the plant and the soil is that microbiome that lives there. So you can actually buy little tablets now to assist with that. Fascinating. I, I uh, was unfamiliar of that being utilized in the conservation sphere. I know that they use that in um, soybean production uh, and planting. They have to expose it to certain types of um, mycorrhizae and uh, fungi to allow for them to, yeah, to feed properly in foreign soils. Yeah. yeah so, you, can, you can do it with natives as well and you just buy them from, you know, like, like any, any nutrient tablet. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. That's great. We'll definitely be following up on that. Yeah. Nice. We will see some of those uh, blackwoods and uh, lightwoods re reseeding rather than just falling over. <laughs> Silver wattles. Um, I think Nathan's got a question. Just looking at Nathan's question here too, I think in, yes, you're grazing at urban pressures, particularly within the Arrow Corridor, are quite great and significant and they're one of the probably in my eyes one of the greatest significant threats and following on from what you said Clive as well like in the middle Yarra um, you're actually not getting regeneration of even your tree and canopy species at this stage so things like your um, yeah just your Viminalis your Managums all that kind of stuff but um, particularly in an area like Morrison's or I'm sure you guys are aware working up the, car the corridors even things like um you, you, well, just even climate change affecting some of these areas and these ecolo ecological niches. Um, as I said, I've highlighted there's some areas where there's some really rare and threatened species that are um, really kind of focused in on these niches that are drying out and changing quite dramatically and nowhere for these species to go. So for a lot of these things, we're actually doing a lot of like um, some translocation or reintroduction programs to put them in areas um, where that would have been so suited or transferring them in and around the park where, um, yeah, where hopefully they can kind of suddenly get, get in some new homes, really. So that's kind of the next thing. Excellent. Uh, do, we, do we have any more, more questions coming, um, coming up? Feel free to put anything you, uh, you're curious about. We've uh, just a few minutes over time, but we have time for one more question if anyone has any. Got one, one last question uh, for you, Cam. I was wondering whether there was any uh, cultural burns or uh, fuel load burns happening up in the middle yard around Morrison's. Not to my knowledge, truthfully, not within, yeah, not within future planning as far as I'm aware. I'm sure it would definitely be on the cards. I know um, they have been doing, the narrative team have been doing doing some burns like up in and around like the Plenty River and all that kind of stuff, but um, nothing scheduled for Morrison's 
at this stage. Interesting. Yeah. Well, long may long may that last. I feel like it's uh, it's a tr tricky area with uh, the proximity of so many houses and uh, such dense dense scrub, dense bush. Yeah, definitely. And I guess we have done works in there to not exactly replicate, but even things like um like Bergen thinning and like um acacia paradoxa thinning as well. So to kind of not completely replicate a burn, but things like open up your understory and remove that competition. Um, so that's kind of some wins that we've kind of worked our way through, but yeah. Yeah, some areas could definitely use with a burn from time to time. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, uh, I think we'll probably finish it up there. Uh, I think it's been a really great uh, insight into some of your projects and really thankful that everyone was able to make it on short notice, despite it not being able to be held in person. Uh, we do hope to hold another event uh, out in Westerfolds in the coming year. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to get canned beards all down and uh, have everyone who was able to make it tonight, or this, sorry, this morning, uh, cool. down in person and see some of these grasslands in action. Perfect. Thank you all. It's been fun. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Clive. Thanks, Cam. Thanks, Lockie. Thanks, Lockie. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thanks all. Have a great day. Bye. Bye, Bye. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. Bye.